Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have a special guest with us today, Dr. Alday here with us from Luberson, and he is going to talk about equine and livestock lameness, um, the diagnosis, daily care, and solutions. Make sure you put uh, something in the comments over there. Let us know that you're here. Ask questions, um, because at the end of this, two lucky participants are going to win a bottle of Luberson HA+. Plus, and you will have your choice of equine or livestock formula. So great. Make sure you let us know you're here. Great prize there at the very end, and we will announce that the winners at the end. Okay, um, just to get us started, we're going to start off with a question for Dr. Alday. What are some preventative things that we can do for lameness? Well, the key to the success in my career has been directed by preventative lameness or preventative medicine anyway. Uh, we have a saying, at least I've had a saying and everybody's kind of adopted from me, is that preventative lameness is a lot more rewarding and uh, basically costs you less in the long run than restorative medicine. And the reason why is because, you know, if in, in my game, you know, which is the racehorse game primarily, which is what I've been doing the last 35 years, uh, when you have to go to the, you know, there are, there are things that can be done restoratively, like fragment removal or uh, let's say working on tendons if you get a bow or if you get a suspensory tear or if you get a cannon fracture, you can put a screw in it. But it's never as good as the original equipment because the one thing about a horse uh, that we found out, or at least I realized a long time ago, is that, uh, you know, they're not like a car. You know, you can't pop them, uh, pop them up on the rack and, and uh, put a new part in. you got to go with the original equipment. So taking care of the original equipment essentially is the epitome of, how you maintain your horse's career preventatively throughout his career. So you kind of be always try to be a step ahead of what problems can and will arise because they're going to arise basically due to the confirmation defects, environment, you name it. I mean, whatever can cause it's the application of Murphy's law, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong, whatever, whatever can injure a horse, <clears throat> it essentially will. If you're, if you're not careful, if you don't do things preventively, something as simple as, you know, uh, hoof care, something as simple as, you know, leg uh, care, looking at things preventatively, uh, staying a step ahead of the problems before they become a major issue or something that, that will make your horse be out of service or will not be functional for you as an athlete, as a partner for a long time, it's, whether it's a race horse, a dressage horse, a western horse, a cutting horse, a barrel horse or whatever. So always... You know, and, and, and it's such a broad category. Preventative uh, medicine is such a it's it's a statement that gets made a lot. But you, know, you really have to think like, you know, when you, you know, put your horse in a trailer or when you unload them uh, on their ground. And, you know, let's say if you're not careful about, let's say, the distance, let's say if your trailer was kind of hiked up a little bit and you had to step a lot and you slipped underneath there or got underneath your trailer. Little things. I mean, just think preventatively all the way. Uh, from the way you handle them, the way you groom them, the surface they're in, the way you bed them, the, uh, everything along the way. So that's that's my application. And I mean, I could go into more specifics, and I'm sure we will as we go on here. But but the the application of preventative medicine is going to give you a lot longer, a lot more rewarding career with your horse than you would any other way. We have a question from Jessica. She said, for a horse that has since healed from a suspensory tear, what is the best support here on out? Okay, well, it depends on where the suspensory tear, if it's a hind leg or a front leg, number one, if you could get that, that helps a lot. If not, uh, essentially two things you know come to mind right away. Let's say, for instance, if, especially if it's a front limb, if it's a low tear, essentially one thing you're going to be careful from this point forward is you're going to be really, really cognizant of the, the angle of your horse, not changing it drastically at all, and helping ease the breakover, let's say, for instance, like either half round shoe, basically backing them up, squaring them off maybe a little bit, depending on what they do. And everything you should do from this point forward is to stop or to prevent that injury from coming back and occurring again. Uh, if it's a barrel horse or a performance horse, obviously you've got to be thinking along the lines of supportive bandages, possibly an ace bandage or the supportive boots, the a neoprene or the uh, 
or the boots that you can get that can help support this area and not put as much pressure on that area of the suspensory anymore. And then also balance in the shoeing is obviously really important, medial lateral balance. If they are not medial to lateral balance properly, this uh, particular problem can be exacerbated, made worse, or essentially you can end the horse's career and create the tear all over again or maybe make it worse. So a lot of things to consider, but the main thing is, uh, you know, support, balance, uh, proper angle. And another thing that's going to be really, really critical, especially on the front end, is going to be your shoeing interval. If you normally went five, six weeks, uh, the fulcrum that the horse has to break over and the length of the toe gets to be a very, very uh, exaggerated and contributing part to putting more and more pressure on that suspensory end or sesamoid or depending on where it is, if it's low, high, medium, or whatever. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration from that point forward. And then being your own best, uh, you know, you're doing your own cursory or your own examination on a regular basis to so see what's comfortable for them once it's healed and the horse is back performing good. And uh, let's say if it's changes from day to day or performance to performance or let's say if you've got a busy weekend and you're making a lot of runs on a rope horse barrel horse uh, let's say if it's a team penning horse you know palpating it see if it's enlarged see if it's uh, hot see if it's swollen uh, see if it's reactive if you flex if you uh, palpate or press on it this sort of thing and you can keep a good eye on it yourself because no one's going to know your horse as good as you uh, will and if they're performing up to par no one's going to recognize if they have a deficit or if they're basically not doing their job the way they should be or the way they did before the injury occurred. So you're going to be the best diagnostician and or person to get the feedback and or uh, to the veterinarian or whoever it is that's, that's helping in this case, blacksmith in some cases, and right on down the line. She did confirm that it is a front leg. Okay. Well, angle is really, really important and making sure that you have support on there uh, both – uh, uh, angle support, ease break over rounded, and essentially all the things, let's say, let's say boots, you know, uh, your preference. I mean, I use a certain type of boot I like. I'm not going to advertise for anybody here, so I don't want to get myself in trouble. But, uh, you know, bottom line is, I mean, you know, do all the right things and then keep monitor it, keep an eye on it, and make sure it's progressing and staying solid for you from performance to performance, workout to workout, this sort of thing on a daily basis. Okay. We have another question that's come in. Uh, my horse has been suffering from osteoarthritis. We are endurance racers. Mm -hmm. What kind of treatment would you advise? Well, osteoarthritis uh, is a common occurrence. I mean, it's, it's a ubiquitous in all mammals. So essentially it is progressive as a rule, uh, depending on what the amount of arthritis is, where it's located and, you know, whether it's in the carpus, meaning the knees, whether it's in the fetlocks, coffin joint. I mean, arthritis can occur anywhere. It can occur in shoulders, can occur in the hips of a horse, not likely. Hocks, stifles. So it all depends on where it occurs and in how you can monitor it, whether or not the effusion, the amount of fluid in, the, in that particular uh, joint is improved or increased uh, due to whatever. Uh, let's say if you supplement, if you inject, uh, you should see a, a drastic improvement and you try to prolong these injections this is why we utilize i mean and i'm going to be a proponent for my own product here uh i put all my rope on uh, lubricin and it maintains them especially the older horses i put them on lubricin plus has msm in it has natural anti-inflammatory effect and it really keeps the joints fluid keeps the inflammation down and helps them as far as maintaining them in between injections if you have to inject where you wouldn't have to do it as, as often or you wouldn't you may actually find that you may not have to do it at all i've got one row horse in particular i've never injected a, jo a joint on i've made a ton of money on so you know and he's been on lubricant all, all the time so now whether or not that was just him as an individual i can't say but bottom line is i'm getting good results and if it ain't broke don't fix it so it's it's a simple premise that way but i mean osteoarthritis comes in lots of varieties and you need to be, in this case, you'll know your horse's performance. You'll know if there's a deficit. You'll know if he's uncomfortable. And you'll see the amount of effusion, meaning fluid or pressure in that joint, how they flex, whether it's the knee, the fetlock, coffin, and, you know, how you're maintaining them, whether or not you need anti-inflammatories and, uh, let's say, a supplement and or 
maybe something as drastic or, or down the road as a joint injection as well. So it really depends on how much deficit the horse is having, how much or how advanced the osteoarthritis is radiographically. If you haven't radiographed it, you might need to, and or how they responded to the therapeutic uh, intervention, whether it's joint injection, therapy, and inflammatories, and or supplementation of, let's say, HA or, or let's say, Adequan, things of this nature. So, you know, you have to, it all depends on, you know, how the horse responds and how well they're doing t- to uh, what you're administering. And, and we got to remember now, as they get older, they may not, they may become, become refractory or may not respond to the therapeutic intervention as well. So then you have to come up with alternatives. And that's when you have to use, let's say, a combination of, let's say, an inflammatory injections and or supplementation combination. So it really depends on how severe it is, where it's located, and then how you, your, your animal, your horse, or your partner responds. All right. We have another question. Um, recovered from laminitis and would like to keep him barefoot. Is there a boot that you recommend for his off days? Uh, well, it depends on how severe the, the laminitis was. If, it, uh, if this horse was radiographed and didn't show a tremendous amount of uh, rotation and or drop sole, uh, it's entirely possible that you could get away with being barefoot. Uh, I like uh, the, the, the boots that are made by uh, uh, the Rudnicks. Um, oh, geez, I'm drawing a blank here. Because um, I've got them. I've got a set of them I use all the time on my horses. Uh, and... They, they are by far the best on the market. They support well. They have a, a, a basically an insert that basically gives you frog support. And, uh, and they have different types of inserts you can put into them. But they, they are probably the best boot on the market. It will come to me here momentarily. I can't believe it. I can't remember this. But uh, we had a barn fire here recently, and I lost all of my equipment. So I'm, I'm, oh, no. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and I lost saddles, equipment, and this sort of thing. And. I lost a full set of those boots, actually, because I had a set of four. Whenever I would go on the road and, and go, let's say, to Las Vegas, like to the World Series or whatever from Kentucky, that's quite a long haul. But I would put uh, the, these support boots on all four feet because horses can founder on both front and hind feet, surprisingly enough. And and uh, I bed my, my, my trailer really deep and, and make sure, you know, I mean, I don't go straight. Uh, I was probably, the, the phone keeps cutting out here. Someone keeps <laughs> I, I, I don't know why it's doing that, but I get it. But, uh, you know, you, you, you want to try to uh, – soft rides. Uh, Kelly, help me out. God bless you, Kelly. Thank you so much. Uh, now, the soft ride product is an excellent product. I, I highly recommend it. We use it routinely on the racetrack. I use it on my farm. I use it to ship my horses in, and I know a lot of professionals that do as well. But it's, it's, you know, I, I don't want to advertise for anybody in particular, but I endorse that product because it's a superior product. It's a really, really wonderful product. So if you can look into soft ride boots, they are expensive, but they're well made and they last a really long time. Okay, we have another question. Um, this is from Christy. Uh, she says, what is your favorite poultice or liniment or mix to use on legs to help with swelling or just to help with recovery? Well, I mean, poultice is poultice pretty much. Uh, the only two that, that I like on, let's say, if something's irritated, if you've got a, if you've got a, uh, a limb that is, is irritated or has shows that it gets irritated due to certain types of mud or constituents in the mud, uh, a good clay that's clean is the anaphlogistine or pneumatizine. They still make those. They, they work. They're very expensive, but they are the, the, probably the Cadillacs of the poultices. Uh, on injuries or wounds, I like using poultice paper, which is animal lintex. Works really, really well. Draws out. It's very clean. Will will pull edema and infectious agents out. And but other than that, I mean, you know, just run of the mill poultice as long as it's a good, clean uh, clay that doesn't have a lot of contaminants in it. And sometimes you can add a lot of your own things to them. I mean, you know, a lot of people will add natural or holistic type uh, ingredients to it, mix it up, and this sort of thing. But uh, just a regular clay, uh, you know, or, or diatomaceous earth type of uh, poultice works really well. The idea is to create an osmotic draw, to pull fluid out of the limb, put it on, and essentially, I like to put it on straight. Some people will put paper on. I'm not a big plastic guy. Plastic just holds the moisture in if you're trying to keep it moist. 
But uh, I like to go ahead and like at the track routinely, we put poultice on a pretty good layer, then put wet paper and put it over top of it and then a banjo on top of that. And what you'll see is when you take it off in the morning, uh, you'll notice that when you pull off the bandage and then you peel back the, uh, you know, the paper, the paper, the, the poultice or the mud underneath it is completely dry. So it's done its job. It's pulled the edema and heat out from the limb. And you'll notice that it's the swelling is, is quite a lot less or maybe even totally subsided and is gone. So that, that's my preference. I mean, you know, I, I, there's like every finish line makes a great product. I mean, there's a lot of good poultices out there, so I'm not going to endorse anybody in particular. But uh, as long as it's a good, clean poultice, if you've got an infected wound, animal intex, and if you have a reactive area, you know, animal, and the anaphlogistine or pneumatizing works great as well. We have another one. Um, what products are offered out there for navicular horses? I've got an eight-year-old mare who's severely navicular. She's not, she's not longer allowing me to shoe her. So I'm looking for options to keep her comfortable. All right. Well, you know, there is, there is an absolute menagerie of like what you can do. I personally am a a big fan of, you know, essentially for a nine-year-old horse, the angle and conformation of the foot for a navicular to take pressure off the deep flexor tendon as it goes across the heel is paramount or imperative in order to maintain the horse. Uh, shoeing is really, really important. Support and or protection of the heel area, whether it's a bar shoe or whether it's a hard bar or whether it's a wide web shoe that essentially is slippered or you you basically pound away the surface so you maintain the cup in there where they don't make a lot of contact and you got a lot more surface area covered by the area of the shoe, meaning uh, in a wide web, let's say like an aluminum shoe. Um, rounding half rounds, meaning that you ease the break over back in the toe up. So those really are really important. As far as uh, intervention is concerned, you can do everything from injecting the coffin joint, putting them on and inflammatories. Uh, you can inject a navicular bursa is, is another thing, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a last resort, but it does work. You can go with, um, essentially, uh, ospos, which is a, uh, a biphosphonate. And this is a good product now, especially for older horses that will really, if you, if you use it religiously and you use it in combination with shoeing, you'll see a, a, a pretty good improvement is it is expensive. I'm not going to kid you but it may well be worth it for a good performance horse. I had a horse a couple of years ago from a guy that was a blacksmith that sent her to me. I blocked out her heel just by doing a posterior digital nerve block and then uh, took some radiographs and she had a fractured navicular bone, only one of two I've seen 35 years of practice. And uh, we put, he actually made a flange shoe all the way around, a bar shoe with a flange on it to use the, the hoof wall itself as an encasement or like a cast of the foot to mi lim limit or minimize any type of movement. And then we gave this mare uh, shots of uh, Osphos and this mare healed up and showed really, really competitively in the ranch roping and ranch horse uh, stuff here in the Midwest and Kentucky. And uh, he kept showing her and she was a champion that he bred uh, himself and uh, until he decided to go ahead and, and use her as a broodmare. So it, it's, you know, I mean, that's a severe case of fracturing navicular is a rarity. It doesn't happen very often, but it can and does occur. And, uh, but this was the extreme mode I use, have used, uh, Osphos on my own roping horses once they've gotten older. Uh, I don't recommend it ever giving it to anything under five years of age or at least five or six years of age. My, my roping horses were 15 and 16 when I started giving it to them. So that's another treatment. And, uh, you know, HA into the coffin and or the navicular bursa along with some steroid can really show a drastic improvement on a horse for performance. And you've got to try to maintain them in between. And what I put mine on in between, if you do that, I'd put them on Lubricin. Lubricin makes a huge difference with MSM in particular, the plus. So that's a that's a real, real, I mean, the, the combination, possibly the injection and that and shoeing along with Osphos, you may get a lot of mileage out of your horse and keep them around for a long time. So, I mean, these... You're going to find that, that the treatment of navicular does not have a set set of plans. You have to customize a program, I think, in shoeing and treatment and therapy and, and supplementation for each individual case. So I think what my best experience has been is I start taking the case and seeing 
what's the least amount I can do, and then, then adding things like, say, one step at a time to see where we can get improvement, where we can get this horse back in the show pen, performance pen, whether it's a rope horse or a ranch horse or a rain cow horse or a sorting horse or a team penning or whatever, and see what's best for that individual. And and so far, I've had a lot of luck. You know, I mean, I can always go to the extreme, but I don't like going to the extreme first. I like to have something in my holster in case the hat does has something down the road. So you've always got an option to exercise as you go progress forward. Okay. This is from Cheryl, and she says, I have a 17-year-old fox hunter, TB. We ride hard over crazy terrain. He has been incredibly sound. How do I keep him that way? Well, I mean, first off, kudos to you for uh, for keeping your horse sound. You're obviously a good caretaker. Um, and, and I appreciate the question because, I mean, this is an everyday app applied question that we all have to live with. What I'd recommend, Cheryl, is uh, it was Cheryl, right? Yes, Cheryl. Yeah. Okay, Cheryl, is uh, that you maintain, like, you know, if you're shoeing a certain way, uh, try to keep that, try to keep your, your shoeing intervals. Obviously, they're going to be a little longer shoeing intervals in the wintertime because they don't grow as much foot. The shoeing intervals can need to be backed up possibly a week, maybe as much as 10 days in the, in the summertime. Uh, being very, very attentive to the horse's angle and wall. Uh, if your horse looks like he's getting a little bit thin walled, something like this, you may supplement with something like Ferris formula, something that has biotin, methionine, cysteine, the, the normal amino acids that help rebuild hoof and hair and things like this. In addition, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, uh, obviously, you, what if you are shoeing your horse during the season and or going barefoot in the off off season, whatever you're doing is working. So I keep doing what I'm doing, number one. But but look at things like the angle, like the quality of his hoof, like his uh, wall. And uh, essentially, if he turns out that he starts showing you a little a foot problem from time to time, maybe start backing his foot up a little bit, maybe go into a little wider web shoe, something like this, you know, to help protect the area. And uh, But like I said, if it's working, you know, I'm a firm believer. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if he's doing good like he is, keep doing, like keep on going, like what, what you're doing. All right. Kathleen asks, what do you think of Animed MSM for joint support? Well, I mean, I've, I mean, I know I'm familiar with it, and, you know, obviously, because, you know, it's a, it's a competitive, pro competitive product versus like, you know, what I make ourselves. I am not, uh, I haven't used it and I don't have many clients that have used it either. So for me to give you a lot of uh, details about like how it works or it's, it's, it's an application, I can't really I can't tell you from personal experience that it, because I just don't have much with it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but unfortunately uh, I, I can't really do that because, you know, I mean, uh, we, we, we keep our joints going with uh, Luberson HA. So if you haven't tried it, I recommend it. <laughs> uh, Laura asks, is ringbone fixable? Well, no, ringbone is not fixable. Uh, ringbone is may be manageable and or treatable. Ringbone is uh, would refer to uh, osteoarthritis or demonstrable osteoarthritis either in the pastern between P2 and P3 or P1 and P2, the, the short pastern or in the coffin. Low ringbone is in the coffin joint or, you know, in coffin joint arthritis. Uh P2, P2, and P1 is, is high ring bone or in the pastern. If I had my druthers, I'd rather have the high ring bone because it's a lot easier to treat. And if even if it does end up uh, fusing that joint, uh, you, you most horses stay fairly sound with it. It's not a big deal. Coffin joint, however, different beast. Uh, from the middle of the cannon bone down, about 23 to 25 percent of the movement of the lower limb of a horse is involved in the coffin bone itself. So if that is deteriorated or is limited to any degree, it can create a tremendous deficit in their gait and or cause them to be lame, so to speak, with have a nod. Um, the way you would address this is obviously you help break over, you keep their toe backed up, you would keep them maybe in a, in a, in a half round shoe, something of this nature. You would, as they get older, you may have to uh, inject the coffin joint itself. You may have to put them on supplement like Luberson and or uh, things of this nature. Adequins is another uh, 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 joint supplement by injection that really helps a great deal. And inflammatories may be used in order to maintain them. And 
you had to remember as that osteoarthritis, okay, in the form of, of, of joints uh, in, in the way of uh, coffin joints in particular is progressive. And as it gets worse, as it gets older, they tend to be a lot more limited in their, their movements. So you want to be very, very proactive. And then you may even have to go to anti-inflammatories to maintain your horse's, uh, you know, athletic career too. So, you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's the end of their career, but it's certainly something you have to get on top of. You have to address rapidly and maintain routinely. And, you know, shoeing intervals, you can't let them go too long in the, in the winter or summer uh, where they have more and more breakover because that puts more and more pressure on that coffin joint and or pastern. So, okay. um, Linda asked, um, I think she wants clarification. You can't ride in soft rides, though, no. correct? No, I don't recommend doing that, no. No, they, they're just strictly for either housing, shipping, or turnout at like small paddocks, something like this, for support and protection. And especially if you have an abscess bruise, something like this. But I know I don't recommend you riding them. That's not a good idea. Andrea has a question. Uh, when dealing with arthritis of the knee, is there a topical or poultice or wrap that you recommend adding to supplements and injections to help keep them performing and comfortable? Well, yeah, I mean, you can use like, you know, any type of poultice. Sometimes sweats work really good, you know, when uh, that means putting on some sort of like something like uh, a menthol and or furosin combination. You can buy certain sweats that have uh, menthol and things like this added to them along with the salicylic acid and other inflammatories. And then what we do is we'll put uh, like sheet cotton on that and then plastic over top of that and sweat them overnight. They do that quite a bit on the racehorses. Um, in, in addition, you can use, you know, topicals, uh, except they can't be used like if you're competing, this sort of thing, because sometimes these things will test uh, the, um, uh, the I, I'm trying to remember, there's a, there's a drug um, that you can use topically, got to use with gloves. Um, that escapes me too. This, the, the, the malady is becoming older. Um, or you guys probably sell it, so help me out here. Come on. Um, I, I, we don't use them much on the track because you can't, you know, have these kind of things around. Mainly, they're used on uh, at, at farms and in rehab situations because uh, because you can't have it on there just in case it were to like a horse get tested and they had it in their systems. The withdrawals on it's a little too long. It's like forty eight hours. So. Um, I'll think of it here. You know, maybe Kelly will help me out. She always comes up. With <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I haven't used. I don't use it very often. And like I said, we use it mainly in a rehab situation. So. Okay. Uh, what signs should somebody look for um, in lameness in their horse? Like, what are the the telltale signs? Well, typically, you know, it, it, it's a great question, and, and it's the one nobody asks, but it seems to be the one that everybody gets, you know, kind of burnt by. Um, first off, okay, you know your horse, okay? And what that means is, like, when I come in and I bring in my rope horses, when I bring them into the wash stall, and I pick their feet in particular, always know what your horse, a good healthy foot looks like. You know, if he's shedding his frog or if he's got maybe – maybe something like up underneath his frog or he's has a penetration, you know, along the sole or something like this and just clean it out and brush it and this sort of thing. And then put the horse's leg back down, check the pulse in the foot, look at the pastern, make sure there's no breaks in the skin, see if the fetlocks are big, either they're like, you know, if they're tight or if they got a little fluid in them, if they're warm to touch, suspensories are in place, the spump bones feel good and tight, the tendon feels good and tight. Knee feels, you know, fairly flat and tight too. Now, if you if you think that one side maybe hey, it looks a little bigger than it was, you know, you, the larger you have is you got another leg. Compare it. Reach over there and look for symmetry. Okay, so that's what I always do with my horses. I look at for symmetry prior to getting ready to saddle them up, and you know, give them a quick once over. When I go down their backs, I'll rub over their back like when I'm brushing, just to kind of palpate along their back, see if they're tender, sore, this sort of thing. Look for the skin, look, make sure that they're not irritated or rubbed by the pads and stuff. Or, you know, you may have to make a difference in, or change in your saddle or your pad or something of this nature. Okay. Or maybe something you wash your, your pad in or, or, you know, let's say 
a horse has a skin irritation and, you know, you just change the detergents or something like that. You know, some horses react to things like this, especially certain colored horses. So, you know, these are things you can do yourself. When you go down their hind end, just like, you know, you pick up the hind le uh, leg, you know, check the hock. Make sure the upper joint doesn't have a bunch of fluid in it. Uh, his hind fetlock, suspensories, tendons, ankle, this sort of thing's good and tight. Pick it up and flex it a little bit. See if he's reactive or not, you know. And then essentially pick up and flex the whole limb. Know what a stifle looks like when it's healthy. If you think one side's bigger than the other, walk around the other side, check it. you got another stifle to compare it to. So just things like this are something that you know better than your vet knows, better than anybody knows because you know your horse, okay? So what I then do is after I, you know, get him good and cleaned up, I'll take him, put him on a shank, and then take him just for a nice little trot down the, the down the shed row. You know, I got a 16 stall barn above above my house, so and, and with a with a concrete aisle, and you know, I mean, it's a perfect place to see if the horse is basically nodding or not. Now, all of a sudden, he has a short gait on both either a hind limb or a front limb, and then as he trots off, you see that he has a nod on one limb or the other. You can basically find and see if, if you know where this deficit's coming from. At least you can, you know, have a uh, an idea of what limb it is. And if you're not sure which one he's lame on, pull up YouTube, look at a, a put up lameness or a, like you know, and then or a nod for a lameness, and they they'll show you right away where a nod is when a horse goes down on the healthy leg and he lifts his head up on the on the on the injured leg it's let's say if he puts his leg down on the right it's the left front if he puts his down head down on the left it's a right front and then see on the hind limb you'll see that they have they'll walk off their toe and won't put their heel down and when the horse toe heels especially on a hind limb that's a dead giveaway that he's got probably got something in his foot or something that's bothering his heel or a frog or something of this nature so these are things that you can do and you should do because the better you know your horse, the more information you can share with a professional as to like what the deficit is or how much worse it is or how it has changed versus what he was. Because like I said, I don't have a crystal ball. When I go to a horse, look at a horse a lot of times, I'm taking a snapshot just that moment. You know the horse for days and years, sometimes his entire life before I got there that day. So the information that you know and you can share with me about your horse really helps me do a better job for you as well. Um, Our viewers are trying to help us out here and they want to know if surpass is what you were trying surpass. to surpass. Very good. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So whoever's did, whoever did that, uh, uh, my compliments. Thank you. <laughs> um, Angela has a question. How long does an abscess lameness last? Huh. Well, let's see. That is, let's see. Uh, they ask them if they bought a lottery ticket lately, because believe me, that's about to, to telling you when the lottery is going to get hit. It's about the same time you can tell when an abscess is going to break open. Here's the killer. Okay. Most of the time, most abscesses, 99, 90% of them, it, there's a variable number. I'm not sure exactly what the accurate number is, but the truth is most abscesses do not break out, break open. Most of them, Basically, we'll show you soreness, we'll show you testing, maybe tender along the coronary band when you soak them in hot water, Epsom salt, do them up with animal lintex, flaxseed, poultice, whatever it is you like, and, or let's say, let's, uh, uh, you know, Epsom salt, you know, that kind of thing, magnesium sulfate paste, I can give you everything under the sun. Fact of the matter is, there's only one person that I'm aware of that knows when that thing's going to blow out, if it blows out. So, and then, and then if you're really religious, you could ask him, he might help you out. So, <laughs> but the truth is, yeah, you can get an idea, you know, and a lot of times I remember once upon a time I came and looked at a horse for a person and that they had started at the foot, had moved at the limb. They'd already seen two vets before I got there. And it, actually I picked up a client over this deal and they said, Hey, I heard you're in the area. Can you come look at this horse? This would go back 35 years ago when I'm my first year out of vet school. And I came and looked at the horse and palpated. And the first thing I did was because I, I was fortunate and very, very, very lucky to work with a guy by the name of Edwin A. Churchill, who's the greatest vet that ever lived, in my opinion, on a horse. And Dr. Churchill said, you know, go with the obvious. So I checked the pulse and broke the front feet and the leg that was swollen. This horse has had a pounding, absolutely emanating pulse on his foot. So I, you know, the lady looked at me and said, listen, this vet said it's the tendon and this and the other. I said, look, he said, I, you know, maybe it is, but it, I mean, that's all swollen. I grant you that. But I tell you what, I said, it looks like it's all 
you know, uh, static congestion coming up from the foot. And, you know, and, 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 you know, what I do is hot water, soak, Epsom salt, this sort of thing, you know, and do it up with some animal intakes of all things. I, you know, I follow my rules. This is 35 years later. Uh, two days later, a lady called me and said, can you come by? It was off the Taconic Parkway in upstate New York. And I'm a native Texan. I went to Texas A&M. So it was a culture shock for me to be up there, needless to say. So uh, I go by and check the horse, and the horse blew out a huge abscess right on one of the bulbs of his heel. And it, it was draining when I got there, and, and the leg had come down quite a bit. And this lady just thought I was some sort of a genius. And I said, ma'am, look, I said, you know, I'd love to take all the credit in the world for this. But the fact is, I said, you know, I said, I, I learned this from a guy that's a whole lot smarter than I was. And I just went with what my gut feeling and what I'd learned. And it looked like it was, you know, I, 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 if you're around me around the racetrack, you get to hear this a lot. I said, but I say this one all the time. If it's got feathers and it quacks, hangs out with other ducks, it's probably a duck. <laughs> so, you know what? The lady had a duck. I just told her she had a duck. You know, she knew she had a duck, but, you know, she just didn't know what to look for. Now I thought. Yeah. All right. We have another question. This is from Kathleen. Do you see lameness very often in the shoulder? Uh, when my horse tries to turn in front, I see that he favors. Walking forward is pretty good. Any advice for this? Well, shoulder lameness as a rule uh, is rare. A primary, primary shoulder. Typically, shoulder lameness is compensatory or secondary, okay? So the first thing I would do would I would be you know, on a good thorough physical exam, which I'm famous for doing, no matter what you call me for, you know, if you ask me to come look at his ear, I'm going to do a full physical and look at the whole horse because I'm wired that way. That's, what, that's the way Dr. Churchill taught me a long time ago how to do it. So and it's worked well for me. It's kept me, you know, fed well, and I take well good care of my family since then. So, but the truth is, you know, when you do the physical, you're going to find most times that the shoulder is probably not uh, primary. It's usually compensatory. However, with that being said, you know, unless or until I did a physical on this horse or I saw a video of a good physical exam and manipulation and or ambulation or straddling, you can't really make that call. But I'd say dollars to donuts, more than likely, the, the likelihood is, is that the shoulder is compensatory to something else, probably a foot or something else, or maybe even a hind limb problem, you know, where it's overloaded into the opposite corner. But I don't know that until I can either see something that, you know, or examine the horse myself. Okay. Uh, before we pick our two winners, do you have anything else to add? Uh, well, um, not really. Uh, uh, this has been really, I, I'm surprised it's going by quite <laughs> Uh, but you guys have been great, and this has been a lot of fun. I hope I've given some good information to you. If you, all, you know, don't get what you want here, if you're looking for individual information, the person lady with the shoulder, if you want to get a video or you want to discuss it, go to our website, go to our questions for Luberson HA. Uh, we can, you can ask questions. We'll get back in touch with you. People at the office will reach out. And we're, we're here to try to a, a, apply and supply as much information as we can for your horse and you know god forbid you know you you actually might buy some lubricant to help maintain them as well so very good thank you very much we've had a lot of great feedback on this live video today so i think you've helped helped a lot of people already i appreciate it thank you thank you very much all right okay. let's give away some all lubricant right. so we're going to give away two and the first winner is Jessica Tim. Yay! Woo! Yay! Big balloons. And, and you and your choice of Lubricin HA livestock or equine. Or equine. And pet. Um, the second winner is Christy Moore Nelson. Yay! <laughs> Congratulations. Great, great side effects. <laughs> thank you very much dr yes. all day for joining us today we really appreciate it thank um, you everybody who has tuned in and like he said if you didn't get your question answered please uh, put them in the comments and we'll try to help you out and get back with you uh, before we get off here we want to remind you of our christmas and july giveaway that's going on now we have nine great packages worth a total value of $2,200, so make sure you get on and sign up. You need to be signed up by the 24th, so get on there and sign up for that. So, 
again, thank you very much for joining us. That was great. Um, if you have any more questions, please go ahead and leave them in the comments and we will try and get them answered for you. So we'll see you all later. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.